Hello, I'm Dr. Rhonda Souza, and this is my colleague, Dr. Stuart Speckler. We are the directors for the Center for Esophageal Diseases at Baylor University Medical Center at Dallas and the Center for Esophageal Research at Baylor Scott & White Research Institute. The editors of GUT have asked us to discuss our report entitled Hypoxia Inducible Factor 2 Alpha Plays a Role in Mediating Esophagitis in Gastroesophageal Reflux Disease. This article is the latest in our series of reports that challenges the traditional notion that gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, develops as a caustic chemical burn of the esophagus. The traditional concept that we were taught in medical school is that reflux esophagitis is a caustic chemical injury, an acid burn. We were told that when esophageal squamous epithelium is exposed to reflux gastric juice, acid and pepsin damage the surface cells and their junctional structures, making the epithelium leaky and allowing acid to enter and attack more epithelial cells. This acid burn is presumed to cause cell death, which triggers the infiltration of granulocytes like neutrophils and eosinophils. And the death of surface cells is assumed to induce a proliferative response represented by basal cell hyperplasia, in which the basal cells proliferate in an attempt to replace the surface cells that were destroyed by acid. And this traditional model sounded perfectly reasonable to us until about 10 years ago when we began using a rat model for GERD in which we would operate on the rats and connect the duodenum to the esophagus. This operation caused gastric and duodenal contents to pour into the esophagus. And we were not surprised that this resulted in severe ulcerative reflux esophagitis. But we were surprised that it took weeks for the rats to develop ulcerative esophagitis. Why should a caustic chemical injury and in acid burn take weeks to develop? If you spill battery acid on your hand, you don't have to wait several weeks to see the injury. Acid burns develop immediately. We studied the histologic course of acute reflux esophagitis in the rats, and our findings were entirely incompatible with the traditional notion that reflux esophagitis develops as an acid burn. Reflux esophagitis in our rat model began with T lymphocytes, not granulocytes, but T lymphocytes infiltrating the submucosa, not the epithelium. The T lymphocyte infiltrate gradually progressed upward into the epithelium, and basal cell hyperplasia was seen days to weeks before there was any apparent damage to surface cells. So reflux esophagitis didn't start with acid destroying surface cells and then later burrowing down into the submucosa. Reflux esophagitis started in the submucosa with T lymphocytes that moved upward into the epithelium. In accompanying experiments, we found that when we took cultures of human esophageal squamous cells and exposed them intermittently to bile salts and acid in concentrations that are commonly found in reflux gastric juice, these brief acidic bile exposures didn't kill the cells, but they did stimulate the esophageal epithelial cells to dramatically increase their secretion of IL-8, which is a very potent pro-inflammatory cytokine. Based on these findings, we proposed a new model for reflux esophagitis in which it develops not as an acid burn, but rather as a cytokine-mediated injury. In this model, the reflux of acid and bile doesn't destroy epithelial cells directly, but rather induces them to secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines. These cytokines attract lymphocytes first, and the cytokines also induce the basal cell proliferation characteristic of GERD. And ultimately, it is the inflammatory cells that mediate the epithelial injury and not the direct caustic effects of the refluxed gastric acid. And we recently reported a study that supports this model in human reflux esophagitis. We studied 12 GERD patients who had severe Los Angeles grade C reflux esophagitis that had been healed with PPI therapy. We then stopped their PPIs for two weeks to induce acute reflux esophagitis, and we performed endoscopy with esophageal biopsy at one and two weeks after stopping the PPIs. 
All 12 patients redeveloped reflux esophagitis with mucosal breaks after stopping their PPIs. And just as in our rat model, we found that this acute reflux esophagitis in humans was characterized by epithelial infiltration with T lymphocytes, not granulocytes, and basal cell hyperplasia preceded surface cell erosion. We were very excited that these findings supported our new concept of reflux esophagitis as a cytokine-mediated injury, and we wanted to elucidate the molecular events underlying this process. In another earlier study, we showed that when human esophageal epithelial cells are exposed to acidic bile salts, the cells produce reactive oxygen species. That suggested to us that there might be a role for hypoxia-inducible factors in the development of reflux esophagitis. The hypoxia-inducible factors, HIFs for short, are transcription factors that enable cells to respond to hypoxic stress and HIFs are known to mediate inflammation in some extraesophageal organs. HIFs are inactive in normal oxygen conditions because enzymes called proleohydroxylases cause the HIFs to be degraded very rapidly by proteasomes. Those proleohydroxylases that are so important for HIF degradation can be deactivated by hypoxia and by reactive oxygen species, ROS. And I just told you that esophageal cells exposed to acid and bile salts generate ROS. So we hypothesized that HIFs might play a central role in the pathogenesis of reflux esophagitis. Specifically, we proposed that the reflux of acid and bile salts that would cause esophageal cells to produce ROS that deactivate proleohydroxylases enable HIFs to accumulate and translocate to the nucleus where they induce transcription of pro-inflammatory mediators. The studies exploring that hypothesis are the subject of our new report in gut. In esophageal biopsies from our 12 patients with acute reflux esophagitis that we induced by stopping PPIs, we found that the development of esophagitis was associated with increased epithelial immunostaining for HIF2-alpha. We quantitated this using H-scoring, and you can see that HIF2-alpha increased significantly by week one off of PPIs, and it remained elevated at week two. In esophageal biopsies from these same 12 patients, we also found that the development of acute reflux esophagitis was associated with increased messenger RNA expression of a number of pro-inflammatory mediator mediators, including IL-8, IL-1-beta, TNF-alpha, COX-2, and ICAM-1. In squamous cells and culture, furthermore, inhibition of HIF-2-alpha with a small molecule inhibitor blocked the production of all of these cytokines, and it blocked T-cell migration as well. Since pro-inflammatory mediator production can be regulated by the transcription factor NF-kappa-B, we explored whether HIF-2-alpha might increase the production of pro-inflammatory mediators through effects on NF-kappa-B. P65 is an NF-kappa-B subunit. When we knocked down P65 with an shRNA, it had no effect on the level of HIF-2-alpha in whole cell lysates or in nuclear lysates. When we knocked down HIF2-alpha with an shRNA, it had no effect on total P65 in whole cell lysates. But in the nucleus, HIF2-alpha knockdown markedly reduced levels of phospho P65 and total P65. HIF2-alpha knockdown also prevented acidic bile salts from increasing activity of an NF-kappa-B reporter construct. And all of this suggests that HIF2-alpha activates NF-kappa-B in esophageal squamous cells. We also found that when we knocked down the P65 subunit of NF-kappa-B with an shRNA, this P65 knockdown blocked the increase in pro-inflammatory mediator expression induced by acid and bile salts. So it appears that crosstalk between HIF2-alpha and NF-kappa-B regulates the esophageal inflammatory response 
to acid and bile salts. Based on these findings, we propose the following mechanism for the pathogenesis of reflux esophagitis, in which HIF2-alpha plays a central role. Instead of the traditional notion that acid causes a chemical burn, our studies suggest that reflux acid and bile salts cause esophageal epithelial cells to produce reactive oxygen species. These reactive oxygen species decrease proleal hydroxylase activity, which enables HIF2-alpha to accumulate in the cytoplasm. The HIF2-alpha then translocates to the nucleus, where it stimulates the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. HIF2-alpha also regulates the activity of phospho P65 and enables it to translocate to the nucleus and stimulate the production of more pro-inflammatory cytokines that mediate the development of reflux esophagitis. We hope that we've convinced you that reflux esophagitis is much more than the simple acid burn that we thought it was for decades. The studies we have just described have identified a number of potential novel targets for GERD therapies. Instead of just focusing on acid, as we've done with PPIs for almost 30 years now, future GERD therapies might focus on a number of molecular targets, like HIF2-alpha, or proleal hydroxylase, or NF-kappa-B, or its downstream pro-inflammatory cytokines. We look forward to some interesting new studies to explore these new therapeutic avenues. For now, Dr. Souza and I thank you for listening to us. And, uh, oh, I see I've attracted a mouse, a knockout mouse at that. Goodbye from all three of us. Bye.